Lily. All right, hello everyone. Um, good to see you all here. Uh, first question, how many of you have heard of Get Your Guide? Our marketing department is doing well. How many of you have actually bought on Get Your Guide? Okay, our site team's not doing that well. We'll work on that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I'm here to talk about growth. I'm here to talk about adoption. Um, but I want to dispel any illusions you have about me telling you the secret growth hack that will take you from zero to one to a hundred. Um, the fact is there is no one growth hack. There is no one approach. Uh, it comes about by how you set up your company, how you frame your, your culture, and how you focus on your customer and on your product. And so let me walk you through a few of my principles, a few of the things that we've learned at Get Your Guide, and a few things I've observed in the industry over the last sort of 10 years working in travel and also observing other industries in the valley where I lived before Berlin. So without further ado, all right, this is uh, Get Your Guide. Um, I work there um, as the VP of Product and Growth. One of our core principles at Get Your Guide is that the customer comes first. That means that when our suppliers want something, we say, interesting, but how does it help the customer? When our partners who, who resell our products want something, we say, great, but how does it help the customer? And this customer focus, um, I'll give you a hint. My entire conversation tonight is about customer, the focus on them and what they need, and how you approach that and attack that fully before you move on to the next problem. So it's all about customer and focus. There's no other like secret sauce. There's no other magic to it. Who is your customer? What do they need? How are you attacking it? How are you getting it right? And then what do you do next? Those are your problems. So let's go through how I view this, how I look at it on a regular basis, um, and hopefully you can learn a few things from it, take a few things back to your own startups, to your own ventures, um, and then if you have questions at the end, by all means, let me know. So the first thing I want to kind of uh, take away from your minds is that there's one like innovative leap that you make, and all of a sudden, you're there, you've arrived. Um, so often uh, in, in product manager interviews in particular, if any of you are product managers, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> but the, the questions are often like, are you building a car or are you building a faster horse? It's a, this old famous uh, phrase from Henry Ford. The problem is Henry Ford didn't just say, hey, I'm gonna build a car instead of a, a faster horse. Henry Ford took a bunch of different technologies that were evolving at the time and he put them together in a new and a different way. The automobile, as a concept, had been around for 100 years at that point. The automobile had been in production for 20 years by the time he did this. Carl Benz was the first one, for all you good Germans out there, uh, who actually introduced the automobile to the world as a production item. All Henry Ford did is he said, look, I need to understand a few things about my market, and I need to figure out how I can make that come to reality to grow my business. So when you look at what they did, the first question they ask is, who is my target market? To that point, when they designed the Model T, most automobiles couldn't run on a lot of the critical roads in the U.S. So you could survive on some city streets. They were cobblestone. They were okay. You could kind of go a little bit out into the country, and you wouldn't fall apart. But as soon as you'd get further outside the city, it's all like dirt roads, horrible conditions, and all these automobiles would literally just fall to pieces as soon as you drew, drove too far outside of the city. So they had to figure out who are they going to target in that set of customers. Is it going to be the farmers? Probably not. They're really, really far out there. They can't make a car that durable. It can't completely replace their horses. Is it going to be the city? Probably not, but maybe some. I mean, there's a lot of crowding. People don't always need the car. Um, but there's a larger and growing set of people who live right on the outskirts of cities, between the farms and the cities. So let's go target those customers. And then what do they need? They need cheap transportation. That's what they needed. They needed to get their goods into the city. They needed to get themselves into the city. They wanted to have a little leisure once in a while. And the question was, how do you transport them better and cheaper than a horse? And so then what did they design? They designed the Model T. It was durable. And it was cheap. They designed it to be inexpensive from the start. And then they operated it in a really ingenious way. They took their, in, their, their motivation from these, um, uh, uh, what are they called? The uh, meat factories. Um, the, the, they would pull the, the carcasses of the animals along a line automatically with a motor. And the insight there was, hey, what if we did that to our automobiles? We could speed it up. We can make it go faster. And if we make it go faster, we can produce more. And if we produce more, it'll be cheaper. And what's interesting is that when they started operating, their principle was, let's just start operating this line, and then let's make it go faster. 
and let's make it go faster, and let's make it go faster. And every time they made it go faster, it got cheaper. And every time it got cheaper, more people bought their cars. Their adoption literally was driven by the fact that they were able to operate in a way that lowered the cost of their product. At the same time, you, you probably heard the phrase, um, you, um, Henry Ford's famous quote of, you can have any color Model T that you want as long as it's black. Well, actually, the reason that happened is because the line got so fast that colors couldn't drive fast enough. And so they only stuck with black at that point. And what did they learn? Customers didn't care about the color of the car as long as it was the right price and it was durable. So again, they, they understood how to get the customers into their product. They didn't overbuild, they didn't overdesign, and they didn't compromise. Having these principles of how you operate and build towards your customer are far better than any, hey, I did a referral program and it worked really well, you should try it. And someone's phone's probably on or a, yeah. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, when you're designing your companies, when you're setting up your culture in your company. How are you going to attack the problem of growth? And it's not just a simple program. It's not just a, a, an easy trick that you read in a book. I mean, you can read books. There's some good books out there um, that kind of give you some of these principles and have tips and tricks in them. But every company is different. Every company is different. Um, and before I go into a bit of the who and how this breaks down, let's describe a bit about the different companies so you understand the context of these principles. So for some of you, as you're looking at the ventures you want to start or the companies you work in, you might work in, like, say, a social company, a gaming company. There you're talking about habits. What, do you, what kind of habits do your customers form? And then how do you capitalize on those? How do you really get them into those habits, get them really using it? Is it sharing? Is it some kind of trick inside the game? What kind of gamification really grabs them? I mean, Pokemon Go is maybe the most amazing, uh, uh, I think, example of this in the world where you could get a bunch of people to run around with their phones in front of them, you know, trying to find the, the Pokemon all over the place. You really captured that audience's desire to see something else in the world. Um, there's also marketplaces like Get Your Guide. I've worked in marketplaces most of my life. Um, and marketplaces are hard because you have a supply and you have a consumer. Um, and you have to get both of them to kind of grow with each other. And that's <laughs> complicated. Um, if you do it right, you have good what's called liquidity. Um, and you can sometimes fake it until you make it on one side, but realistically you can't fake both sides. You have to get one side to grow and then very quickly you have to get the other side to grow. And if you don't, you have someone unhappy on one of the sides. Um, and then you have like consumer products, direct to consumer. So I've built a hard product, a washing machine. If someone wants to start a startup that has a washing machine that takes my clothes, puts it in there, washes them, dries them, folds them, and puts them back in my dresser, I'm totally going to invest. Um, but consumer products are a little bit different in that you have to understand what your customers really want, what they need before you launch the product. And then you have to figure out how you talk to them when you're launching that product. It has to meet their needs when you're launching that product and you find the channels where they're in. Um, and then B2B, this is the, like the, the typical freemium model. Um, how do you get into their ecosystem and then how do you get them addicted to it because they can't now get off of it. Their processes are built on it. Their behaviors are built on it. So each company is different in how they approach it. So keep in mind as I go through, some of these might apply really well to some of the areas. Some of them might not apply at all. Um, if you have questions around those, we can talk about it at the end, but uh, just keep that in mind that your business is different. Every business is different. Every customer is different. Um, so know your customer, know your product, position it correctly, and then we'll go through some principles. So one of, the, one of the key things on who, particularly when you're starting your startup or when you're launching a new product, you should be asking yourself, not who's your customer and like, I want to sell to all travelers. Yes, Get Your Guide would love to sell to all travelers. That's my dream. Realistically, we've got to pick. We've got to choose. There are many customer segments that we could go after. Who should we go after? There's many needs that they might have. Which need is the most important to solve? When you're preparing to launch a product or preparing to design a product, you should really think through these elements of your customer needs, your customer segments, because then you can actually position your product correctly. You can see if there's any opportunities to take advantage of as you're launching your product. So for example, what are some of the default advantages of your product? What does your product naturally have that other products coming before it do not? What are attributes of the technology that you're leveraging that you don't have in other spaces? What are your default disadvantages? So why will you be at a disadvantage when you launch? And I have a few examples of this. Um, and then the other one is like, what are your core customer motivations? What are they really, really, really trying to do? Do you understand this, yes or no? If you don't, you probably don't know what product you need to build first. So you need to stop and really think about what's their motivation? What's really getting them up you know, really getting them passionate about something. Because if you don't have passionate customers, they kind of show up, they're a bit interested, and they go away. 
and then you don't really have a, a growth wheel. If you can't retain anyone, if they're not passionate about it, there's nothing to really grow upon in the future. Um, and then finally, reach. So if you look at your product attributes and you look at your customer attributes, do they meet somewhere? And is this somewhere big enough for you to really capitalize on? So again, an example of this is get your guide. Um, so we discovered about, what, three years ago, sorry, one of my one former colleagues is over here, about three years ago that um, um, it turns out a lot of people want to see attractions. Who would have thought? And it turns out that a lot of people are asking, where can I buy attraction tickets? Who would have thought? Um, and so we thought, wow, okay, interesting. Why don't we just start talking to these people? And where do we talk to them? It turns out you talk to them in a very boring, normal, typical place, which is Google. So you go on Google, you place an ad, and they click, and they come to your site. It's brilliant. And then what we figured out is, oh crap, we actually don't have enough availability, enough tickets on our shelf to get them to convert. And then it was like, okay, our product innovation here has to be get the tickets on the shelf. Get the tickets on the shelf. That is the primary driver of them. Okay, great, fantastic. Um, based on that one identification of the customer segment, i.e. attraction, travelers, and based on the identification of their need, tickets on the shelf, we could optimize and focus our product development and our marketing engine to really capitalize on that and drive growth. Now, it might not seem super sexy, it might not seem like the coolest thing that you've ever done, but it's totally practical and the results are phenomenal. And that's exactly what you want in a startup. It's not about being the coolest kid on the block. If you're the coolest kid on the block, you're probably missing the opportunity to be relevant for your customer. <clears throat> Another great example of the who and also the what is Tesla. Tesla is an interesting company because if you look at a battery, a battery has a, a built-in advantage that when you connect it to an electric motor, all of its force comes right at the start, which means that when you're driving one of these things, it is awesome. It is freaking awesome. The disadvantage is, of course, batteries are expensive. So you can't just say, hey, I want everyone to buy an EV, electric vehicle. You have to actually find a way to get it cheaper. The cool thing is Tesla did this the right way. They said, okay, if it's a lot of power right from the go and they're expensive, let's go for sports cars because rich people buy sports cars and it worked. And their first car was crap. The te the, sorry, you know, Elon Musk, don't shoot me with the flame floor. But I mean, honestly, the Roadster wasn't that you know, great of a car. It was essentially a hacked together version of some other car that they stuck a battery in. Um, but it worked, it got people interested in, hey, you know, this is a fun car to drive. And more importantly, it taught Tesla how to build a car. So then their next model, the Model S, was actually a success for them. I mean, success is debatable. It's not like a super profitable model, but it basically increased their sales and drove adoption. And the reason is because they understood how to build a car. They understood that rich people were going to buy it because one of the motivations of rich people is still that they care about the environment. So, hey, we can get rich people who want to put money down for a very expensive vehicle to buy an electric vehicle that's exciting to drive and also environmentally friendly. It is a brilliant positioning of their product. And so they, they captured the who really, really well. I can't sell it to anyone, but I can definitely sell it to people who want to thrill, people who are rich. And they capitalized on that emotion of I care about the environment. And then what they built as a result was actually a really great fit for that market. And they're continuing more or less to continue to do that where you see them failing tends to be on execution. So when they decided to get cool and put, you know, winged doors on their Model X is actually where they failed because executionally that's hard. It disrupted their ability to maintain their efficiency and continue to grow. Um, so again, it, who, what, ignore the coolness, go after your customer, give them what they need. So a little bit about what, um, quick story. There's a guy walking in the woods and it started to rain. He got wet. He got cold. He walked past a housing development. They were building some big, big, beautiful houses. And he saw a construction worker coming out of one of the new houses um, and asked, hey, can I pop in? It's raining. And the construction worker said, no, 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 no. I haven't hooked up the sauna yet. The jacuzzis aren't hooked up yet. There's no hot water. It's not, it's not ready to, for anyone to go in yet. He said, okay, fine, and walked on. Um, a little while later, he passed a, a, a woman who was kind of putting together a, a prefabricated shed. So, you know, one of those sheds that you kind of buy and you can kind of stick the walls up and stick the roof on. Uh, and he said, ah, this is great. Um, you know, can I, can I join you in the shed? She says, oh, it's not quite done. I still have to put the tiles on the roof and I still need to paint it first. Um, you know, maybe if you wait like a, a day or so, you can come in. It's like, 
well, I'm, I'm wet and I'm cold now. I'm not wet and cold in a day necessarily. So he wanders on. And eventually, he runs into a woman in the woods. And she says, hey, come here. Can you help me? He's like, sure. What do you need? And she's like, oh, I want to put this tarp over the branches so I can stay out of the rain. If you help me, you can join me. I'll light a fire. We can dry ourselves by it. All he needed was branches and a tarp. That's all he needed. When you are wet, all you need is branches and a tarp. So I often like to think about the world of product development and company development as when you're a startup, you need a mud hut. That's all you need. That's all you need to, in order to solve your customer's core problem. Now, eventually, this mud hut, as you evolve and test and learn, is maybe going to become kind of a, a cool, modern, but not super huge house. Um, you know, a nice place to hang out, a nice place to relax, but maybe not luxurious, maybe not over the top. And eventually, as you grow, as you push yourself as a company, then you can start to say, okay, how does this become a true Rolls Royce rather than a Toyota Camry? How does this become a penthouse or a mansion rather than a, a, a small house uh, on the hill? Um, maybe you have a multitude of houses in your portfolio because now you're a true multi-product company. But again, when you're attacking a new product, think of the product's initial stages as a mud hut. Think of your company's initial stages when you're starting up as a mud hut. If you think more than that, you've gone too many steps into the future. And it happens all the time. I mean, this is maybe one of the critical mistakes that startups make is they sometimes can launch too early, but more often I see them launch too late. When you're looking at this, again, here are my principles for sort of thinking about it. What are the customer's needs? What problem must I solve? What problem must this product solve? Not what I want it to solve, not what I hope it solves, not what you know, my investors want it to solve. To be honest, your investors are sometimes your worst nightmares because they have lots of opinions and lots of ideas. They want to be helpful, but they don't always understand the context. What do my customers need me to solve? Constraints. What can't technology do right now? What can't I really do in my industry? What's blocking me? And then finally, what are my assumptions? What must I validate as soon as I launch? So if I, I launch the, the product and I haven't set myself up to really understand what's going on, if I haven't set myself up to learn, to gather data, then I can't actually follow on with how do I improve this? How do I go from a mud hut to a house? How do I go from a house to a penthouse? How do I launch four other types of houses? If you don't collect the data, if you don't know what you need to learn, you're not going to make any progress after your first launch. So at Get Your Guide, again, back to my own experiences here, when we really started pushing on attractions. So when I told you a bit ago, we found this thing that worked. Hey, people like to buy tickets if they're available. When we started doing this, our site was no prize chicken. I mean, this is, you know, this is a, what, 19, or 1999, 2004 type website at this point. Um, but it worked. It was enough. The real, the real step for us was make sure that you have the tickets on the shelf. And then, of course, since then, we've improved the page. Conversion rates have gone up. We've optimized. But the real step was making sure the tickets were there. No, it wasn't perfect, but that didn't matter. And I think it's, again, bias early, if anything, rather than late. There's a lot of great examples of late. Um, but I have three that I wanted to share with you just to kind of help you get a feel for it. So um, how many of you have actually heard of Vindigo? Good. I figured no one would have. So before Foursquare, before Looped, there was a company called Vindigo that tried to do location uh, mapping, location services. Um, hey, you can essentially map where you've been on, in, in locations. And it was way too early. And the reason it was way too early is the way that you could track your location wasn't very um, easy in a world where you didn't have a smartphone. And so it's a great idea, interesting idea, but the technology wasn't there. So the question is, what could they have focused on instead of that? I won't speculate, but the point is, if your technology isn't ready, if your industry isn't ready, it's difficult to position your product in a way that will sort of push you into that success zone. Great idea, a bit too early from a technology standpoint. The next one is iOmega, one of the few examples maybe of a product launching before it should have. Because how many of you owned a zip drive? This is maybe dating me. <laughs> yeah, so zip drives um, were kind of a cool, you know, high capacity thing that people um, really liked in the late 90s, I guess. 94, 95 is when it launched, and 99, I think, is when they got bought and started to go under. <laughs> but um, one of their problems was they'd, they'd stick these drives in, into the drive, and the drive would actually break it. 
the disks would fall apart at a very, very high rate. And of course, all the customers are like, look, I bought this because I want to store a lot of stuff on it, and I have a lot of stuff on it, and now it breaks. What am I supposed to do? So they hadn't fixed this problem before they launched. And as a result, they had a bunch of very upset customers. And then very quickly, they got disrupted by other technologies, and they had a lot of people who weren't very happy with them. So reliability became a concern. They launched too early. They didn't fix their core problem, which is I want to store a lot of data in a reliable way. And then finally, my favorite Google, <laughs> Google Wave. How I love you. Um, a product that launched probably a bit after it should have with far more features than it probably needed. Some features which were probably too early and some features which were way overbaked. Um, they had the right idea, hey, let's go after Facebook and leverage what we have to create something even better from a social networking perspective. However, the execution was, sorry, Dan, typical Google where it's like, hey, let's invest a lot of money, and then let's put out this great product, and then let's you know, just get everyone to adopt it. The problem is, again, the, the focus on the customer wasn't quite there. The what really wasn't refined. And so it was a smattering of a lot of, a lot of different pieces, a lot of bits. And as a result, they were late to the market. They couldn't drive the adoption. It wasn't engaging for customers, and then eventually shut down. Interesting attempt, interesting try. They probably learned a lot along the way at Google. Um, however, it was a, a product that was a bit late to the market and way overfeatured for what it needed to be at, at the start. There's probably a lot of other examples of this out there. Some of you have probably sat there and thought, well, I can't quite launch yet because I haven't fixed this bug. I can't quite launch yet because I don't think this quite looks right. Honestly, if it doesn't block your customer, get out there. Get customers to touch it. Get their data. Understand who they are. Um, perfection is the evil root of failure at the end of the day, in my opinion. <laughs> And the last uh, question that I always like to ask uh, is then how do you put these things together and take it from this initial spark and blow it into a huge explosion? So how do you actually not just go from zero to one, but how do you go from one to 100? Um, I'm a one to 100 guy. I've never started a startup yet. I hope to one day. Um, but I've spent you know, my time at Get Your Guide and my time at uh, Expedia launching new products with, I think, you know, a decent support of an established system and then scaling them. Um, so I know a lot about how, and one of the things I'll tell you right now is the key to how is culture. It's not, hey, a certain type of testing or a certain type of data or a certain growth hack. It's actually the culture that you build around how you want to scale this thing. So there's two things about culture that I think need to be ingrained. It doesn't matter if you're a hierarchical organization. It doesn't matter if you're a flat organization. It doesn't matter if you have no management hierarchy structure at all. Um, the point is, there can be different organizational structures. And some teams might value you know, the, the late night parties, and some teams might value the work-life balance. Some teams might value different things. But the point is, for all of your values, I'd strongly encourage you to think about two. The first is your customer. Follow your customer. Follow your customer, not your investors. If you're the CEO, don't have your team follow you. Um, if you're the CPO or, or head of product, don't have the team follow you. Follow your customers. The second is focus. Get something right. Get it right before you move on to the next thing. If you're trying to do too many things at once, you'll end up with a lot of things that don't quite work. They're not quite solving the problem. Once you know how to do something, once something's really serving your customer, you can add a second thing. And that first thing will keep serving your customer, and you can experiment with the second thing. And then eventually, when that's right, you can add a third thing. And eventually, when that's right, you can keep going. The point is, if you're trying to take on too much at once, particularly as a young startup, you're going to get distracted. When you get distracted, you lose sight of, again, what does your customer really need? And it also will limit your ability to tackle problems in your original product or your core product before moving on to something else. If you're not solving that core customer need, if you're getting distracted, you're going to end up building something that's maybe not appropriate for them, that's maybe not really serving them. And just adding a new feature won't necessarily serve them any better. It's still not serving them. So again, follow your customer, focus on one thing at a time, get it right. And then, of course, with this are, again, some principles. Qualitative. Don't outsource talking to your customers, particularly as a startup. Um, so I mean, if you become a very, very large company, at some point you're going to outsource your customer service organization in all likelihood. I don't know of any companies of huge scale that don't. But realistically, when I say talking to your customers, when you're a brand new startup, honestly, pick up the phone and do customer service. 
Um, even when you are a growth company, when you become, I think, get your guides 440 people right now, I still go to the customer service office and take calls. Why? Because I get to hear the problems of the customer. Um, I have a research team in-house at Get Your Guide now because I want to get our direct input from the customer. I don't want to say, hey, research firm, go tell me what they need. I want to hear it. I want to have the data. Don't outsource talking to your customers. Two, data over opinions. And this is the critical one. Everyone from your board to your you know, co-founders to your employees that you bring on will have opinions. It doesn't matter. My, my opinion is better than yours only because I have no data. Once we test something, then I will know if my opinion is better than yours. And this is what I say to my team a lot. So when some of them, um, you know, someone will sometimes run a test, or not run a test, they'll just launch a feature, launch a design update. And I'll say, look, I don't think this looks right. And they're like, well, no, 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 it's going to help the customer. It's going to help the customer. And I say, look, my opinion is the only one that matters right now because you don't have data on it. And then guess what? The next time they run a test, so that when they bring it back to me, and I say, I don't know that this looks right, they say, oh, wait, wait, I ran a test. Conversion rate is up 3%. Fantastic. That's exactly what you want. You want data over opinions, which means also that you have to set your, your culture up and to set your startup up, your, your product up, to use and create data. So one, how are you tracking things? How are you monitoring things? Again, it can be qualitative. It can be s customer calls. It can be you know, sales reps talking to the enterprises that you're trying to sell to. It doesn't have to be just pure you know, data points uh, from a mix panel or a, a Google Analytics. It can be just qualitative. However, you should start to find out where the qualitative comes from, um, or the quantitative comes from. The point is, um, once you're starting to collect this, you need to build it into your culture that data comes first. You need opinions of where to go, you need data to validate it. And if you don't have data to validate it, you don't know if you're, if you're in the right direction or the wrong direction. And so you as CEOs, you as leaders in your startups, data over opinions. When you go to someone and say, we should do this, you should teach them to push back on you and say, no, 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 we can do this, but then we want to see if it's right. Or, actually, my data says we should do something else. Encourage that behavior, and what you'll get in your startup is actually uh, the behavior of solving the customer problem based on what you see from them. Not on what you think, not on what you believe, but what you actually see in the data, in their response, and then ultimately, you'll see it in the growth. And then the last one is test. So, I say A-B test if you can. So some startups, of course, when you're very small, you can't A-B test. You don't have enough traffic. Um, so if you can't A-B test, if you're too small for that, start with prototyping. Seriously, go do prototypes. Get out there into the field and talk to people. If you're past the prototyping phase, but you still don't have enough visitors or traffic, go actually survey. So you can put a survey on your site. Is this useful? I mean, maybe that's not the best question. The UX researchers in the room will probably criticize me on that. But um, you know, at, do surveys. Figure out if you can get enough qualitative data that gives you sort of a quantitative feel of where you sit right now. Um, but definitely test what you're doing. Make sure that you're on the right track. Make sure that you're not developing something that's not useful. Um, because if you are, then you're just wasting time. Make sure that what you are developing is serving their need. Otherwise, you're building a lot of stuff, but it's not aiming in the right direction. So again, A-B test if you can. If you can't, there's other methods, but definitely find a way to collect that data every time you make a step in your product. Make sure you're getting that feedback. That feedback is critical to improving what you do. And I guess sort of my last thing is, like I said before, this isn't going to be a bunch of you know, tips and tricks on how you uh, do the, the perfect growth hack or, or something like that. It's really about the process that you go through to drive adoption. Focus on the customer, do one thing at a time. What I will say, I think the, the, the core of this is, when you look at how you approach this problem, uh, and you ask the question, what, what are these concrete marketing tricks then that I can use? Again, go back to the beginning, the who. Who are my customers? What are inefficiencies in my market then with my, that my product can solve with them? How am I positioning that product? And then how am I going to operate on that? So your, your marketing tricks basically fall out of that, which is one, ignore all the hype. Someone tried to do you know, uh, a referral program. It worked really well. Doesn't mean it'll work for you. I've worked in travel for 10 years and I've yet to see a referral program in travel that blows me away. It's just the reality of it. It's hard to get it right in travel because while you might be looking for travel, it's unlikely that all of your friends are looking for travel. So the probability that it spreads far and wide is low. It doesn't quite work in an industry where you travel, a great customer travels twice a year. It will have some value, but it's probably not going to be your growth like exploder. 
So ignore the hype. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Focus on what tools you have available. Go where your customers are. So if you look at Tesla, for example, when they went where their customers were, what did they do? They went to auto shows because they wanted to get the like gearheads who had money and they wanted to feel a car push them back into the seat as they accelerated zero to 100 kilometers an hour in three seconds. Yes, I really love that vehicle. Um, it's fun to ride in. Um, and two, they also basically went to all the rich VCs in the valley and said, hey, we have this car and it's environmentally friendly and you can drive it around to be cool. It's, techn it's a technophobe type thing, or technophobe, sorry, technophile type thing. Um, that's awesome. That's how you reach your customers in the right place. And sure enough, in 2012, 2013, I started seeing Teslas pop up all over the 280 freeway in San Francisco. And I thought at that time, it's time to buy Tesla stock. And um, gosh, I wish I had because it would have really exploded over the next couple of years. Um, but that's the point. They went where their customers were. If you think about Get Your Guide, we went with where our customers were. Our customers were already in Google. Why build a brand new referral program? Why try to create a new channel? Why go off into some you know, unknown land? Why launch an offline marketing campaign if we know our customers are in Google? They're there. Just go there. Talk to them. They'll come to you. If you have a good product, they'll buy. If you have a very good product, they'll repeat. And then you have a real business. The only thing I would say is once you get there, change the rules. So if we had just gone to Google and said, okay, you know, here's some ads, let's go, we probably wouldn't be as successful as we were today. We rethought the SEM space. We said, hey, let's automate this. Because then it's not just about 10,000 keywords, it's about 10 million or 100 million or a billion. That's the kind of numbers that we think about at Get Your Guide. We change the rules of the game. It's not about some manual pushing of stuff and kind of uploading some new bids and playing around with you know, some ad copy. It's literally automated. And that's our game changer. We change the rules in that way. If you're Airbnb, I think all of you have probably heard of this growth hack. Um, when they didn't have the supply side of their business really set up well, Airbnb went to Craigslist. And they basically contacted owners on Craigslist and said, hey, do you want to come up onto Airbnb? That's not how Craigslist is supposed to be used, but it worked. They changed the rules. They went where, in this case, their suppliers were, and they changed the rules. So this is the other thing, when you're, re when you're really looking at how to scale up in your various areas, you're looking for these places where there are inefficiencies, where can your product position that's different, take advantage of it, and then go into the channels where your customers are and just do something different there. Just don't do the same thing over and over as other companies, do something slightly different. It doesn't mean go off, you know, go off and do something completely crazy. It doesn't mean um, you know, go to Google and say, you're going to hate the site in the ad because, yeah, you get some clicks, but you probably won't get the clicks that you want. Um, but do something different that makes you differentiated in your use of that channel. Because then you're the first mover there. You're the first one to do it. It takes a long time for competitors to catch up. And if they try, it turns out that after a while, the same trick gets old and doesn't have as much effect in the future. So I think there were a couple companies who tried to do the same Airbnb hack afterwards, and it wasn't as effective. It just wasn't. People tried it. Referral programs used to be extremely, extremely effective, and actually their effectiveness, depending on industry, is starting to get really low. Why? Because everyone's asking all their friends to sign up for everything. So find where your customers are. Ignore all the hype about, you know, hey, you need to try this hack or that hack or this other hack. Focus on where they are. Go to that channel and change the rules. And my last point is, your adventure is going to vary from mine. So Get Your Guide had great success um, going in one direction, building a travel business. Yes, we use a lot of Google. That's where a lot of travel businesses are built. Um, doesn't mean it's our only focus, but it's definitely where we drove a lot of growth from. We focused on attraction customers at first, and we're, diff you know, we're branching out now. We're, we're going from our mud hut into our maybe nice you know, home on a hill, but we don't have our mansion. We don't have a portfolio of houses yet. Um, but as we grow, our experience is going to differ for each of yours. So what is your, what's your business? What's your business model? Who's your customer? How is your product going to be positioned? And then ultimately, how are you going to operate on this to make sure throughout the entire process of growing your business, you're focused on the customer and you're trying to get one thing right at a time? Those are my principles. That's how I think about growth. Um, it's worked so far at Get Your Guide. I hope it continues to work at Get Your Guide. It's been a great experience there. I hope some of this is helpful for you as well. Hopefully you can apply some of these ideas, some of these principles uh, in your day-to-day uh, -day work, either at the companies that you're at or in the startups that you're going to start. So again, focus on the who, the customer, focus on the what, how do you position the product, what's the minimum that you need to build, and then finally how. How are you going to operate this thing when it launches? 
If you get those right, I believe you'll have success. Thanks. Um, I actually work in a corporate um, organization and we work a lot, uh, we think a lot about work culture lately and I have a lot of colleagues who like Simon Sinek especially and he has a little bit of a different approach because his first step is I, I think it's uh, why and not who and to me it's like I think it's an inter uh, it's a different approach because you're saying um, this is what your customers won't do it and I think why is make them believe they want something else and do you have any experience with this and what's what's your opinion about this just in general yeah so I guess the way I look at the why question um, when you're when you're trying to open up a, a market that is maybe not that well known. So for example, let's take an example of Get Your Guide. Um, how many of you have actually taken a guided tour before? Not from Get Your Guide, just a guided tour in general. How many of you bought it online? Even fewer of you. So the point is the penetration of online guided tours is quite low. One, it's not necessarily, or it hasn't been the most convenient way to do it in the past. And people also don't know it's necessarily available. And more importantly, a lot of people don't even believe they want a guided tour. Um, if we are trying to open a market in that way, you want to ask the question, why? Because you have to understand what would motivate the customer to then go into that, that direction, that behavior. Um, and so it becomes kind of a marketing problem at the end of the day. So how do you, it is a, po a product positioning question, it is a customer question, but it becomes more of a marketing question. Why can you convince someone to do this? Um, the who is more like, um, so if you think of our, our, our attraction example, we don't have to convince people to go to attractions. They just want to. I mean, 7 million people go to the Eiffel Tower every year. Great. Let's just you know, help them skip the four-hour lines in the heat of July. They love it. Um, there, we can actually spend time building up this customer base, and then we can start thinking about the why question of tours. Why would someone want to take a tour? I mean, there are some other questions like, why would someone want to buy an Eiffel Tower ticket on Get Your Guide? Sure, those are product things that you need to go through. Um, but ultimately, we can think about the, the new segment question, the why question um, afterwards. So it's, again, opening a market rather than a, a core product positioning. Okay, thank you. Makes sense. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really cool. Um, and thanks for sharing on the... Um, it's really crazy that you still go on the customer support and talk to <laughs> the customers. It's quite crazy. Maybe you can dig a bit more into that on... Um, on the process, especially when, let's say, for a startup who doesn't really have a s customer service as developed, mm -hmm. and how do you really like do the survey, uh, especially in the earlier stage, actually? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple different ways to approach it. And uh, again, it's going to depend a lot upon the product that you're launching. Um, I, my experience is with marketplaces. And the reality of marketplaces almost always, if the, a consumer is buying something, they almost always immediately call with a problem. I mean, it's just sort of the, I don't know, the, some law of marketplaces. Um, you launch and the customer call comes in. Um, with uh, customer service calls, I, I mean, I think with the marketplace, you have those at your disposal. But you can actually deploy like survey tools on your website also. Um, in the early days, it doesn't matter actually how much you're generating revenue per se. You kind of want to know, is this product speaking to the people the way I expect it to? So throwing up a survey that might disrupt their flow is actually OK if, you're, if your real aim is to learn how the product's positioned. Um, if you're a marketplace, you will start getting customer calls so you can understand what's broken and what's not. Um, and you can also just take it out and you know, do user research. So walk out into you know, uh, Alexander Plots with your mobile phone. Hey, how does my travel app work? Um, if they say, cool, OK, you, maybe you're onto something. If they say, yeah, you know, it's interesting, you, you're totally off, off base. So again, there's different techniques to gather that feedback. As a startup, you can't use the high volume quantitative data that you know, other companies can use, but you have lots of ways to talk to customers. If you're a, the difference is more like if you're a, 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 like a direct con to consumer product, so a hard product, again, washing machine, seriously, anyone who wants to do that. Um, if you're a washing machine you know, startup, you're going to probably do some prototypes of your end product, and you're probably going to do some focus groups where you kind of walk people through it, and they get to touch it a little bit and kind of start to understand what it's about. And you can usually use that as a way to generate an idea if you're heading in the right direction. Um, if you're a, a B2B company, a lot of that is building the, the, the beta for, or probably the alpha, actually, <laughs> for your product. And then you actually start to se sell it. You go out and you say, hey, I've got this thing that's starting to come up, and here's what it does. You know 
take it. And what you'll start to get is adoption or some kind of interest in it. So again, there's different techniques depending on the, the industry that you're in, but you can almost always get the qualitative feedback from somewhere. Hi, uh, I have a question more related to the how you are previously your experience mm -hmm. and also now at Get Your Guide, uh, how you grew the, the team, but more on the engineer and designer side. Mm -hmm. uh, so growing it, but also um, related to the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a very, very good question. Because again, if you're a startup and there's like five of you, culture is a lot easier. Um, as you become 50 or 100 or 400, culture gets a lot harder. And so, again, if you have some principles that you walk in with, i.e. the customer comes first, data over opinions, uh, focus. You can make sure that as you bring people on, you can actually interview them for how have they put the customer first in their role. Um, one of the, I think, uh, sorry for all the engineers in the audience, one of the challenges I think some engineers have is like, you know, what gets you excited to come to work? And it's like, yeah, I'm working on the coolest algorithm right now, it's so awesome, what does it do? Uh, it, it, yeah, it kind of like ranks results. Okay, what, it, what does it really do for the customer? Uh, you know, it helps them find stuff. Okay, what's the goal? Like, you kind of, like some people don't really get excited by the outcome. And so you can actually start to, when you interview people and talk to people, are they excited by the outcome? And so as you hire, as you scale, it's hard because you have to turn away some people who are really good, but you're building that culture of I value the outcome, not technology, not some design that I made. You're valuing the voice of the customer. You're valuing how it affects them. Um, and this is, you know, with designers, it's the same thing. It's like, it's a great design. It's going to work. Cool. Let's test it. Oh, no, it doesn't need to be tested. Yeah, it does. Get the data. And so, again, you can, you can, as you talk to people, really make sure that as you're bringing them on, they embrace this culture. Um, and then later down the road, when you're scaling up and you can't kind of look at everything all the time, you can trust that your team is really putting data over opinions. You can trust that they have the customer interest at heart. Um, and I think you know, what I've seen at Get Your Guide um, is that we've done, a, I think, a fairly good job of making sure that who comes into the organization embraces these core tenets of our culture. Now, Get Your Guide has other cultural values as well, of course, so they have to also fit those. But the core culture of customer first, we make sure everyone has. It has to be part of it. What are you interested in? The outcome to the customer. Um, so it's, I'm, I don't know how much that actually answered the question, but you know, it's, it's really like, you know, focus on when you're hiring, make sure the people embrace that culture that you're building in them. And if you follow, again, my principles, it's, you know, make sure customer comes first, make sure that you're able to stay focused, make sure you're using data over opinions, and that's what you can really screen for as you're building up that team. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the informative chat. Um, following up from your uh, points that you make about um, value in the outcome, customer comes first. Um, you were speaking about prioritizing, like experiments and, uh, and the customer segment and uh, the core value proposition. I'm wondering, within the team, a lot of the times the focus on the outcome is big KPI, which is revenue, mm -hmm. and the focus on the customer a lot of the times isn't inclined uh, to to achieve that revenue as fast as it can. So an, an increase in experience in the customer might not mean like an increase in revenue immediately. I was just wondering how you guys deal with that internally. How do you prioritize? Uh, is it uh, ease, confidence? How, how do you guys kind of yeah, so get through that barrier? I guess one, one thing I would say is that if you can't measure it, you shouldn't do it. Um, and that sounds really harsh, but the reality is that even customer experience, if you believe this is truly a better experience for the customer, it will show up in your data one way or the other. Um, the thing is, it doesn't always show up in, if you give a team a, a revenue target um, and they don't really have full control over revenue, they're not motivated by that. So you, sometimes you have to find a KPI that's better. So it can be a click-through rate, it could be a conversion rate, it could be a repeat rate. Um, the point is you can break down that revenue to a level that they can control the behavior on. But then, for example, you know, working on customer experience doesn't drive revenue. Maybe not quickly, but then if you believe it's going to, I would say, you know, say, hey, our job is to improve some part of the site to what we think is good customer experience, run a bunch of tests here, make sure that conversion rate doesn't drop, for example. So if it goes down, I'm going to tell you you're probably on the wrong direction. Um, then after you're done, really go and see, did this cohort of people that you've been testing on actually improve their long-term value. If they didn't, guess what? It doesn't matter. So you can always measure everything. I mean, 
there's some things you probably can't measure, like how are your customers feeling today? Um, but the point is, if you can't measure it, you can't invest into it. And startups, I think, again, this is where um, even if the measure is qualitative, so you're getting feedback from the customer, you want to be able to measure it. Otherwise, are you investing in the wrong area? And startups have nothing if not a hard constraint on their resources. So again, you can put a measure in place. It might not show up immediately, but then you have to have a plan to kind of go back and understand, did it really work the way you expected or not? The idea isn't to keep investing for six months and hope it works. It's do it for a month, see what happened. Again, you can you can kind of set it up properly. I, hopefully, that's uh, about what you needed there. Yeah. <coughs> there were a few questions. Um, you were talking about changing the rules. I'm just wondering what's the way in which you guys change the rules at Get Your Guide. So I think um, <coughs> the the marketing automation work that we've done, in, at least in our industry, was a complete game changer. And in our industry, so one thing I like to say is if you think about um, tours and activities and I asked you, how would you search for a tour and activity, or activity? You would come up with a different way than probably the person next to you and then probably the, the 10 people around you. If I asked you how you would search for a hotel, you'd probably all have similar ideas of how to do it. Um, so when you look at like on the booking.coms of the world, who've done a great job of automating SEM, they've done it on a very, very small, relatively keyword set. And what we said is, why can't you apply that to a billion keywords? Why not? Build a machine and, and start doing it. And yeah, there's any number of inherent challenges there, but the point is if you get it right, you're not uh, limited by how many people you can hire to do calculations in Excel sheets. You're not limited by an agency's ability to take on uh, this challenge. You also get into things like, well, if you're trying to automate, what about automating ad content? And then all of a sudden, well, if you're automating ad content, what does that mean for things like natural language processing and other machine learning algorithms that you're putting in place? So it starts to get really, really sophisticated over time. But what you start to do is not look at Google as a thing that you manage in a traditional marketing sense. It's fully technologically enabled. Like we have marketers, but they're all product managers at the end of the day. That's the change, or one of the changes. The other ones I won't talk about yet. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, thanks for your talk. I really like the who, how, and what stuff because I could relate with my startup as well and the startups I worked. So uh, I have a question, something related to A-B test and then on retention. So the first question is um, when you do your A-B testing on uh, on a particular segment of uh, for a product feature, let's say a product release or some product feature, so how do you segment what like what's a good way to segment when it comes to A-B testing? And my second question is on, you talked a lot about growth uh, and you know uh, who, what, how, but especially in uh, Get Your Guide, uh, where reten retention could be a problem because uh, a user probably buys like twice a year or so, so how do you retain your users and especially on a challenging uh, online marketplace. Mm -hmm. Cool. So there's two parts to that, and I'll start off with A/B testing. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about details of how I look at A/B testing later. But um, so for A/B testing, you have to understand um, what you want to test. So you should have a good hypothesis. You don't just kind of say, "Hey, I'm going to launch this test and see what happens." If you have a good hypothesis, you're likely to be able to identify your segment. As a startup, I would encourage you to keep your hypotheses. Um, broad enough that you don't have to segment your already small traffic into smaller traffic because the time it would take you to get a significant result is a very, very, very long time if it's not a 30% change in whatever metric you're looking at. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage you to stay rather broad as a startup and as you get bigger, then yeah, you can start to segment down and you can be a little more targeted at who you aim at. Um, that also goes back to if you've built a product that is too wide, then you, it's difficult to actually do an A-B test that gives you good data because then you're touching 10 segments of customers and then you don't actually know what any of them are telling you. And so if you've built a, a startup on a core segment and a core need, it's usually easier to get clear data out of your testing as you grow. Um, so on, on A-B tests, again, I would avoid segmentation if you can. I would focus on covering your, your whole set and then just making sure that it's you know, big enough before you launch a test that it's not gonna take you a month to, to or two months to see a significant result. Um, one other thing about A-B tests, a lot of people like to launch A-B tests like 1% or 10% or 20% and then eventually go to 50-50. The only reason you should ever not go 50-50 on an A-B test is if there's this huge performance concern on your system. 
That's a hard principle that I have. Why? Because if you run an A-B test at 10% and it takes you five weeks to see significant data, it turns out that you could have run that A-B test for one week at 50% and gotten the same result. And when you're a startup, the key thing to remember is that your speed of learning is your greatest asset. The speed that you understand if you're solving the problem or not is your greatest asset because then you can decide, am I investing in the wrong way? Or am I investing kind of in the right way, but it's not actually solving the problem yet? Do I have to shift a bit? If you don't learn fast, you're going to be building in the wrong way for a long time. So 50-50, hard rule. Hope all of you agree with that. If not, happy to debate it afterwards. <laughs> um, so that's the A-B testing side. On the other side was retention. Yeah. So if I had done like a, a proper growth funnel here, I would have talked about two things. I would have talked about the, you've probably heard it if you talk to investors, your CAC, your cost of cost, yeah. uh, acquisition. So how much does it cost me to get someone into the store? Um, and then second is your CLV, which is what's the value of your customer over its lifetime. And within that, when you look at throwing a lot of fuel onto the fire, um, again, if you have really, really bad conversion, please don't throw tons of fuel on. Throw enough on to be able to figure out why you have bad conversion and fix it. Um, that's kind of point one. Point two is, if you have decent conversion and you have no retention, please pour just enough fuel onto the fire so that you can start to get customers through and you can test how to increase your retention. And increasing retention, again, varies by the industry you're in. I get your guide. We're a low frequency product. I mean, there's some people who are oddballs and they travel 100 times a year or they buy 100 tours a year on Get Your Guide. And I love them because they're buying a lot and they love Get Your Guide, which is fantastic. But I don't understand it. I wish I could buy that many tours a year and travel around. Um, but so there's, cer there's certainly that, that odd group. But then, yeah, most of them are twice a year, three times a year. The question is, is your core experience solving their need very well? And if it is, if they feel very satisfied, um, they're more likely to come back. Now, at Get Your Guide, our retention rates are nothing like you know, the retention rates of a game. So even games that are pretty crap, their sort of one day or one week retention is probably better than Get Your Guides. Their one month, probably not, because games tend to get boring really quickly for people. Um, but there's a lot of challenges in a marketplace like ours. But if you have a good service and it's really solving that customer need, it turns out next time they need to solve that, they'll probably come back to you. The other thing is, it turns out, that if your customers are always asking for, I don't know, attraction tickets in Google, um, even if they don't quite remember you and they ask Google for, I don't know, uh, a Vatican tickets instead of Eiffel Tower this time, they'll find us again, but they'll say, oh, I know, get your guide. And so instead of converting at, you know, whatever small percentage, now they're at like 20%, and it's fantastic. So it, it actually helps your, your marketing over time. Um, investors don't like it when people don't come back direct, but honestly, if they're coming back at a very high conversion rate, your cost of acquisition is very low. So a trick there that you guys can think about. Um, but yeah, so it is hard, but if you have your product right, if it's really targeted well, solves the problem, you tend to get good retention. And so, yeah, if I were to draw that all out from a growth funnel, I would say fix your conversion first, get it right, only pour enough on to fix that, and then only pour enough on to get enough retention for you to be satisfied. And then once those two things are in decent shape, you can pour in a lot of fuel. And then you'll start to optimize those even more. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Um, I have a less technical question. Uh, you said earlier briefly that it is always challenging to open a marketplace. I can imagine in this case is also there are quite some f challenges. Would you say like the supplier side is in a in a way also something like a customer, someone who you have to please? And where is the line where you say okay? Uh, to this degree, we can see the supplier as a customer and we have to really fulfill his needs instead of the buying customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So um, whether I'm talking about Expedia, where I used to work, or Get Your Guide, yeah, there are supplier concerns. Um, and mar some marketplaces will be different. But in general, a lot of your suppliers in a consumer-driven marketplace um, are motivated by money. I mean, very bluntly, if you give them bookings, they will show up. And if you don't give them bookings, they will go away. Um, there's different marketplaces out there. So um, one of Airbnb's challenges was they were trying to get people to sign up for Airbnb who weren't normally 
wanting to get money in the same way that like a tour operator or a hotel chain is. And so there was some motivation they had to create there, which was like a little additional money in your pocket and also, you know, a chance to meet interesting people who maybe travel to your city. So they had to blend a little bit else to kind of reach into that, that need of their supplier in this case. And there's other marketplaces. I mean, like ad networks are marketplaces at the end of the day where there's some set of ads and content and some set of consumers of it. And again, often what the end goal of the content provider is our clicks, but the dynamics are slightly different. So again, it depends a bit, but when I look at like travel marketplaces, suppliers almost always just want money. And that more importantly, if they're good, they want incremental money. And so a lot of the questions they ask of you is, where's my incremental value? Um, so if you're good at bringing both sides up of the marketplace together, then you'll get consumers who see enough on your shelves that they're happy, and you see suppliers um, seeing enough consumers that they're happy and they keep loading rates or availability or whatever it is. Um, and that's the, that's the trick, is like there are interests of the supplier, but often they're motivated by how many consumers you can get onto the marketplace. They're not motivated by, we want you to change the design of your website. We want you to update the design of your tools. Um, if you look at some of the, the classic um, tools of some of the OTAs for the suppliers, they're really bad. They honestly are really, really bad. But it doesn't matter because they make so much money off those OTAs that they're just going to stay there. They're not going to move because the customers coming in produce a lot of incremental value. And that's good for them. That's what they want. Um, so yeah, there are, there are motivations of the supplier, but again, really really narrow down what those motivations are. It's not about them being really, really happy about the features of your site or the features of their portal. It's about them being happy with the fact that you're providing something for them, typically. Yeah, just my experience in that area. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, so you talk a lot, a lot about the importance of finding your who, mainly like targeting, uh, and you gave some great examples when your customer is a consumer. Uh, do you have any like good examples of when your customer is uh, a business or any advice on it? it would be really appreciated. Um, yeah, so <laughs> funny that we just talked about suppliers. Let me go back to Get Your Guide's early days. This is actually before I joined, so this is more stories that I've heard in the lore of Get Your Guide from our co-founders. Um, so when Get Your Guide first started, um, the idea was let's create a P2P tours and activities marketplace. So it, just like Airbnb, we're going to get people like you who want to show people around Berlin to take people around Berlin. Um, and it's I, you know interesting idea, really cool. A lot of tour operators actually are just you know one person shows. Um, the the problem is if you really really look at that, the who there on the supply side is very very small, um, and they're not that motivated to provide a consistent experience. However, if you just shift to professional and start looking at people who do this for a living, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these people, probably millions of these people across the world, and they want to be on your marketplace. And so their first who on the supply side was actually wrong. And they actually had to pivot the company and go towards a different who. Um, and when they got that who right, it turns out that all these people signed up and the consumers actually found uh, you know, uh, stuff to buy on the site. So again, you can, if you don't think about the who right, you'll get it wrong. And the supply case, in this case, they, they kind of got wrong in their first step. Um, and I think that's one of the, the great stories of Get Your Guide is that they, um, you know, they made a failure at their very, very beginning, their very start, and they pivoted and they found that right who on the supply side. So yeah, it does exist. Um, it's just, I mean, it doesn't really matter which side you're really looking at. So on a marketplace, again, if your goal is to get both sides really stood up, you have to ask the who question kind of on both sides. Um, if you have the who solved on one side, then it's really the who on the other side. Um, or it can be, if I know I need to get, uh, if I know attraction customers are just really easy to get, if I talk to them, then it, your who on both sides is very clear. Uh, the who on one side is the attractions, and the who on the other side is people who want attractions. Like, it becomes clear. But yeah, it exists on the supplier side. Thank you all.